But here is our conversation on growing gold from bottles, if you will, and other materials such as hematite, magnetite, and others with the help of a microwave oven. You're going to have to listen a little intently because Dr. Maluski's voice is there, but we got it as best we can. But this is an interesting conversation. Here goes. Well, you were talking about how we get gold out of glass. So if it's in the water and it's in the air, it's also in the ground, in the soil. So a different crystal structure. Quartz is a crystal structure. Magnetite is a crystal structure. Uh, uh, garnet and lutea, all these crystal structures. I found uh, uh, monetar, I found uh, uh, precious elements in there of gold, platinum, palladium, rhodium, and iridium. Mm -hmm. We're getting them out of that thing because they're in the crystal structure. You have a crystal structure. It forms like an energy nest, and inside of there, these guys go in there. So gold is very happy to go into the crystal structure of quartz. <coughs> Rhodium and iridium go into the crystal structure of magnetite, uh, hematite, and, and ilmenite, the different structures, and even uh, uh, full school. What's that called? Uh, uh, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pyrite. Pyrite, yeah, mm -hmm. it's in there. They're finding mm -hmm. that stuff in there. In fact, there's a little more gold in that than the rhodium and iridium. Mm -hmm. So these different crystal structures contain these elements. And I found out that when I used microwave processing, we could can take these things in the form of armus atoms in the gold and the quartz and add electrons and bring them back to the metallic state. <coughs> and if I got this... Uh, the, so in other the, words, they, they become, they are uh, monatomic, but essentially you have a process that makes them diatomic again. Yeah, bring them back to a true atomic. It actually is the electrons we convert. I have a DVD here mm -hmm. uh, which shows that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's in, in focus or not. It says growing yeah. gold. Okay. It's on the internet. You can get my name on the internet and get it about it. And uh, the point is that we found out that <coughs> in taking plain bottle gas, container glass, and heating it in the microwave, <laughs> we're, we're, the microwave, what you think, you heat things in the microwave, uh, microwave, it's, the waves are moving back and forth and you get more of a stirring action. You take a plain crucible and put glass in it and put it in the microwave, and heat, I mean in a regular furnace, and heat it up, it just sits there as a quiet liquid. Mm -hmm. You take that same material and put it in the microwave, heat it up at the same time, it's stirring, it's moving, it's turning, because the waves wave back and forth, the wave isn't steady, it's, it's waving back and forth, and as the heat's a little more here, you get convection currents, you get stirring action, you get red, and it tears these atoms apart, opens up the quartz structure that's inside the glass and releases these atoms and when it's doing that as you open up the crystal structure you release electrons electrons grab onto these uh, 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 monatomic elements and make metal out of them talking with Dr. John Maluski about bringing gold in out of hematite and other metals and um, as well as glass with the help of a microwave oven. This was from the Tesla Tech Conference 2011. Let us continue. Oh. And, and metalizes those things, and you and you cool it down and pull the glass out. There's little gold beads floating on the top of that stuff. So, it, 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 <coughs> to take that all the way to its conclusion, a person can make that process, and then that is actual, real, physical oh, yeah. gold again. One of the guys who've taken my process, he's gotten up from I don't know. He won't tell me how much, but he got somewhere between two and five ounces of gold out of beer bottle glasses. He takes beer bottles, and, and he 
cooks the hell out of him in the microwave. He, he burned out half a dozen microwaves, but he had heavy duty. <laughs> he had heavy duty industrial microwaves. I'm using just a kitchen type microwave, mm -hmm. and it's not strong enough. So I haven't got the yields that he's gotten. But I've heard from five or six different people who've bought, bought my DVD and played with it. And if they had the experience in working in fire assay and working with furnaces and insulation and stuff, they've had some pretty good results on this stuff. We, what recently, or I, I've, I've taken the uh, black sands material and I've uh, gotten volume and iridium out of them. I don't know if they show up on you. Yeah, the yeah, yeah that shows up. You can see it. Good, you can see it. Mm -hmm. Also, if you look closely, you'll see there's a sphere here, but on the side of that sphere is another little clump of metal. So I think this is rhodium and that's iridium. Mm -hmm. Iridium melts at almost a thousand degrees above, so it crystallizes much smaller when it comes out. It's a much finer crystal than the, than the rhodium. And that's coming out of black sand. Mm -hmm. We live here in Albuquerque, mm -hmm. and I look out my window from my room and I see Sandy Mountain about two miles away. Mm -hmm. That's 11,000 feet of a granite mountain. Mm -hmm. Granite is 2% magnetite. Magnetite is 10% rhodium and iridium. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. You look mm -hmm. up the statistics in the geography books and say, well, the only real sources of rhodium and iridium are over in Russia or, or in South Africa. <laughs> you know, and we're, we're... So don't go look for them yeah, here. Yeah, and, and they are told, they're no, they're, oh, you could take that black sand and send it to the best labs in the world. There's nothing, there's nothing in it, not even parts per billion will they see any rhodium and iridium. Take that sand stuff and put it in the microwave, cook the hell out of it. Mm -hmm. And you get these little metal beads, and you look at the metal beads, and uh, they're, uh, what it is, you can tell they're not silver. Because if you're doing silver and gold in a standard fire assay, when the melting point of the metal is close to the melting point of liquid lead, it, you're solidifying a ball. When you melt the ball, you get a nice smooth glassy surface, mm -hmm. and it solidifies, you get something like a Christmas ball, nice and shiny and smoothy. Mm -hmm. That's gold and silver come out looking like that. But if you get a silver bead, it comes out looking more like a soccer ball rather than a regular ball. The surface is irregular, it's got crystal facets. It means when uh, in doing the assay process, you, it ends up the, all the metal is collected in a lead ball. Then you put the lead ball into what they call a coupel, and a coupel is something that sucks the uh, when you heat it up, it draws and sucks all the uh, lead out of it, leaves the precious metal behind. Well, with the higher melting material, it's not. You're not melting, it's coming out, it's not solidifying the melt, it's concentrating from a saturated solution. It's like uh, growing uh, rock candy. You have a saturated solution, and it'll crystallize it. Mm -hmm. So the facets on the surface on this has crystal facets on it. Mm -hmm. So you know it's a higher melting material, and if it's silvery and higher melting, it's not going to be silver, it's going to be platinum or rhodium or iridium, any of those higher melting materials. Mm -hmm. And so, and then if there's two different metals, you'll get a, you'll get a different crystal structure. Song and dance on ornaments material. Ornaments and elements come, there's 13 elements in the middle of the periodic table down here. They go from mercury, gold, platinum, iridium, osmium, uh, ruthenium, rhodium, palladium, silver, and copper, nickel, and, and cobalt. They have an ability to change their structure and lose their electrons, and they become chemically inert. So a typical atom of gold, which normally has an atomic weight of 196, when it loses its electrons, the outer electrons, get, they, form, they combine and form Cooper pairs, they become whirlwinds of light, they, they shrink down in size, and so let's say you had a, a typical element that was the size of a, a tennis okay. ball, it'll shrink down to about the size of a jelly bean. All its elect outer electrons move, and then the, the shielding is from a dent, and everything gets pressed down. And because the, the, the outer electrons become whirlwinds of light, it's speeding at the rolling at the speed of light, so they get high spin nucleus. The nucleus becomes a high spin, shrinks down to a size of a jelly bean, comes chemically inert, and actually is equivalent to one of the inert gases. See, in the periodic table over here, you have the no normal inert gases from neon down to krypton and radon. Gold, which normally is 196 molecular weight, because of its develops its diamagnetic field, levitates four ninths of its weight on the Earth's magnetic field, it becomes equivalent to a 109 
molecular weight, which is between xenon and krypton. So it's an inert gas and it belongs over in this part of the periodic table. We have to change the periodic table to make room for these elements in here. But we know they're over here. I know, and my understanding is, if you look at the, go to the handbook of physics and chemistry and look at the boiling range, boiling point of xenon, it's not a point, it's a range. It's up, uh, it has plus or minus three degrees centigrade boiling range for a xenon. And xenon's a single element, it should have one boiling point. The reason it's different is because it absorbs and reacts and combines with these different inert gases here, and they form what I call uh, azeotropes. An azeotrope is two, two elements, you're getting a group right? two elements that combine in a liquid state that do not separate on boiling. So they combine, that's going to change the molecular weight of this and the boiling range is going to change. So that's why xenon is plus or minus three degrees centigrade because it, it forms azeotropes with some of these ormus elements which are like gold or platinum or iridium. So, so, so the ormus elements then are formed from other elements. So they're formed from, from themselves when they lose their electrons. Gold metal becomes gold ormus, not from another material, but just it loses its electrons, change, changes its structure, changes its uh, um, a, equivalent atomic weight and its chemical activity completely disappears. All chemical activity is due to the outer electrons. If you lose your outer electrons, you lose your chemical activity, and they become inert gases. These things are, are inert because the outer electrons form a tight ring, and so they're not, they don't combine. And these don't combine because they have no outer electrons to start with. So, so, this, so the, the, the idea, it, it sounds like then, is since these Ormus elements, like since many of them might be potentially gases, right. but, but by restoring them to their normal state, uh, you, you could recreate Convent those back into the metal. But see, so they're in the gas form, so they're in everything. They're, they're, you hear these things, they have a diamagnetic field, so that means that they have a, a magnetic component. You heard of the runner's high, you heard of the mountain climbers high, or you heard of the yogi sit down, breathe uniformly, get this, they're bringing in this magnetic energy, it's energizing their soul and their spirit, and they go into, out here it's manana, which is tomorrow, so they're in, you're getting goosebumps again, you tell an absolute truth, you get it. And they, they get, it brings magnetic energy into the body, and the spirit is magnetic, so you're energizing the spirit with these breathing exercises. So it's in the air. And as a result, it's in the ground and it's in the water. These elements are in everything. David Hutton says, everything you breathe, everything you drink, everything you step on contains ormus elements. The tiny little jelly beans as compared to tennis ball, moving in and out of everything. But what is unique about them is they find a crystal structure like quartz that's in here. Quartz has a crystal structure, has uniform magnetic and electric fields in there. They go in there and they, they find like a little energy nest and they stay in there. Whether it's quartz or magnetite or hematite or, or zeolite, all these different crystal materials contain these ormus elements. And they're in there for a while and then they go out. But while they're in there, if we put those things, a beetle bottle or something into it and heat it up and get it in a liquid glass, well it's in the glass form and we, we heat it with the microwave, we stir these things apart, we release electrons. Those electrons are able to be picked up by the ormus and they can reconstitute them from the ormus element, chemically inert, to a metallic state. So and in a sense, it's almost like dehydrating an atom, except well, instead of moving yeah, your water. You're, doing, you're taking part of it, we are building it back in. You're taking it from a chemically inert, we add electrons back to it, becomes a metal.